So as I said, we have three uh, great uh, presentations today. Each one of them would be around 20 minutes. Uh, we are starting with uh, Dragitsa. Uh, Dragitsa uh, is a program officer at the Office of the Special Representative to the UN Sec Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. She's leading policy advocacy with the UN General Assembly Third Committee and guiding development of special projects and research studies in the front office which includes uh, prevention, climate security, trafficking, and the denial of humanitarian access. Her work uh, is informed by the experience of growing up in Bosnia during the conflict in 1991 uh, and 1995, and then leaving as a refugee in Serbia and then the United States. She's currently uh, based in New York. Uh, in her presentation, uh, uh, she will situate children and armed conflict in the context of climate insecurity, which is a very, very hot topic these days around the world, uh, especially uh, where she is based in New York, uh, experienced something extraordinary over the last week. Uh, and the primary research uh, that she's going to present is from several countries on the UN's children and armed conflict agenda. So, Dragica, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Payman, um, and thanks to the Alliance for giving me the space to do this research. Uh, it's a pilot of sorts, as this is um, in the drafting process for the paper that is coming in hopefully September this year. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, thanks in advance to Stacey, our producer, who will help me navigate the presentation slides. So um, the space I'm taking is really to help us look at some of the initial emerging impacts of climate insecurity on children affected by armed conflict, which is the agenda that I work on. Next slide. So as Damon mentioned in um, the intro to my presentation, really what I want to achieve today is help us situate these two agendas of the UN Security Council, children and armed conflict and climate peace and security against each other showcase a little bit, uh, although it's still not published research, so I'll share as much as I can in terms of examples from cross-regional um, research that I've conducted over the last six months. I'll share more about that in a minute and really express some of the recommendations that are coming through conversations that I'm having and that I've had with colleagues based in the field and otherwise. Next slide. But first, I would like to use um, an icebreaker to get to know you a little bit. Uh, this is not typically an audience that we speak to at the global level, so I'm really excited to know uh, first where you're based and um, where you've seen, if you've seen any impacts of climate change on your work specifically. So the production team will help me post the Mentimeter link in the chat and um, we'll look at the results together in a few minutes time. Wonderful. I see some countries on our agenda, Nigeria, Afghanistan. Don't be shy. <laughs> Great, some of the uh, we are country colleagues. Iraq, wonderful. Myanmar, also countries on our agenda. Very interesting group. And thank you so much for choosing our session. I know there are a lot of really great um, discussions going on. Cameroon. Also, a country that we cover, DRC. This is wonderful. Thank you for helping me understand where you're at and your context. Ethiopia, great. Welcome, colleagues. South Sudan. Right. So we have about half of the group who have inputted their answers. 
Uh, perhaps we can move to the next question in a second. Oh no, this might be more right. Welcome, welcome all. Um, since this is what we're talking about, um, I'm really curious to see if in your work you see effects of climate change already in your context, in your country, um, location. All right, that's a resounding yes. <laughs> Oh, yes. I think we're all in agreement that climate insecurity is an issue um, in all of our spaces from global to, I guess, central. Thank you for that. This is really helpful in giving me a sense of our audience today. Since um, the work that I do is at the UN headquarters level and uh, very much global in nature. So we can go back to the presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. I hope that that was on a little bit of a change from just listening to the presentation. Um, so the next point, I wanted to talk a little bit about context as the slides come up. Why look at the climate um, emergency? Well, it's at the top of the international agenda up to the highest levels of our leadership at the UN. Uh, the Secretary General has been really critical as a voice in ensuring that uh, member states are taking concrete actions to address this issue. Um, in 2017, this is the climate peace and security agenda piece that I wanted to share for those of you who are not following uh, what is happening in New York on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, resolution was passed on Lake Chad Basin that had for the first time elements mandating our mission to consider climate in its work. And since then, 12 other uh, resolutions were passed with such language, both in country-specific, but also re uh, regional contexts. Nothing yet on thematic issues such as gender and children, but we're trying to change that a little bit as we push the discussions in the peace and security space on thematic issues. So that growth of the climate peace and security agenda, although there is no single kind of backbone resolution that pulls it together because of pushback of some countries that feel that this is to be discussed in the development space, as you can imagine, we are still um, trying to, to advance these um, debates. Uh, also from the field perspective, for those colleagues who are participating in the monitoring and reporting work, on the ground, um, we are getting some nascent reports of things like flooding and drought and contextual analysis that are affecting the work that they do. So there's a real need for looking at this intersection of climate with overlay of conflict. Um, and finally, when we took a look of the first 25 years of our mandate implementation, about two years ago, one of the gap areas for research that was identified uh, by stakeholders working on children and armed conflict was climate uh, change specifically. So what have we done as a response? Um, next slide. And um, I'm hoping that my sound is okay. Colleagues are flagging that. Um, that might be a bit of a problem. So I hope you can see me. Um, what we did this year was look at this gap through primary. And I mentioned that I will be putting forward a framing paper, a discussion paper in the UN headquarters in September this year. Next slide. And for um, methodology and how we went about doing this, we looked at the 25 country situations that we currently have on our agenda to see where some of the references to climate shocks are coming up in our reporting. And as a result, across three regions, we've selected Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Myanmar, Somalia, Syria, and the Philippines for interviews with colleagues on the ground. I've also conducted a field research trip to Mozambique uh, in December last year and spent six days in Cabo Delgado, specifically looking at the intersection of the climate and uh, conflict 
work, as most of you know, in the province of Cabo Delgado, the areas that are hard hit by tropical storms are also uh, hard hit by the insurgency. And finally, I have consulted experts who are looking at the intersection of climate and conflict specifically, informing government action on these issues through the Security Council work and some of the child protection actors who are in think tanks and civil society. Next slide. Some of the overarching observations from the research are really that from the climate, peace, and security side, there's absolutely no substantive understanding of the impact on children affected by armed conflict in that space substantively. Um, so there's absolutely a glaring gap on the children's angle. And um, all of the colleagues that I've interviewed on the ground and other experts have pointed to the fact that the work that they did in preparedness and risk assessment that might have taken you know, a two year or five year cycle are now happening on a yearly basis because of the intensity and frequency of climate related events that are compounding on our agenda. And I won't have time to go into this uh, this morning, but I have extrapolated gender and disability as two factors to specifically look at in terms of how they're shaping experiences of different children who are particularly vulnerable. Next slide. And so for those of you who are not familiar with our agenda, um, what we focus on is our framing are these six gray violations that in 1999 through passage of the first of the 13 Security Council resolutions that we are implementing right now, um, the, the Security Council identified and condemned these violations. And uh, the most sort of known of the is uh, 1612 from 2005 that has given us robust tools of the Security Council Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict, which is a subsidiary body of the Council that um, reviews the information that's coming up through the monitoring and reporting mechanism on the ground uh, that's composed of our partners like UNICEF and other agencies who are doing the uh, collection and verification of the data on a periodic basis. Next slide. So the way I organize the research is really around the six gray violations. Uh, this is how we approach most of our special uh, studies. Sort of. And what I wanted to point out here is just the most robust example that we have so far in our public reporting from uh, 2022 country report in the Philippines. This is in reference to some attacks, uh, alleged attacks by armed groups in the aftermath of uh, Typhoon Rai specifically. And that's as specific as our information has gotten to date. Next slide. And in using a couple of examples across a couple of these violations, I can give you a little bit of an indication of where the impacts are going in terms of conversations from the field without sharing too much information again, due to unpublished research. So the denial of humanitarian access was one that was really grasped both in terms of how colleagues were articulating that armed forces and armed groups um, were exploiting the situation of emergency relief, sometimes to deliberately intercept an attack, um, or sometimes to, this happened in the instances of attacks on schools as well, actually. Um, and also there was um, a very clear link in terms of tactical military approaches that are increasing vulnerability in areas where operations are taking place. Um, some of the, some of what came through is that the government forces who are delivering emergency aid and supervising emergency aid delivery are um, deciding who can enter security areas, therefore um, blocking some groups from delivering uh, life-saving hate to, to children in the aftermath of emergency and examples like that. So this is one um, angle and aspect that I wanted to, to showcase here. Uh, on the next slide, I wanted to just mention the fact that all of my respondents have spoken about the secondary impacts, particularly in displacement situations of um, negative 
coping mechanisms such as child marriage and sexual exploitation. And also all the beauty risks that come with children, particularly adolescent girls, unaccompanied children when going to um, fetch water outside of their villages and camps, for instance. And there is um, data to back up the increased rates of child marriage, for instance, in drought affected areas. So um, unfortunately, as we have conversations with member states and some stakeholders, linkages are really contested, uh, even though for us, they may seem obvious. And like I said, the empirical evidence is still missing. And on the next slide, I wanted to just share a couple of points on the treatment and use of children. Perhaps this is the one where I found some um, attempt to really do this in an empirical way. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, Onidir's project on managing uh, exits from armed conflict. They're doing a longitudinal study of um, push and pull factors in a couple of areas where um, they're interviewing um, adults and children in some cases, although it's still very adult-centric about what, um, what is their motivation for joining groups. And, um, and so that's the only research that I've seen so far that's um, pointing in the direction of real trauma data. But um, it's, like I said, very obvious that armed groups are tracking things like um, uh, harvest times to come and replenish their supplies after hiding. They're aware of these cycles and when they happen, they're also um, exposing communities in the direct aftermath of the tropical storms for already vulnerable to the recruitment tactics. And this was seen through um, parents and, and children in association with, with families. I've also been told that there are some cases where boys are armed to, um, to join pastoralist groups who are protecting themselves in, in cases where their livestock um, and livelihood opportunities are threatened. This, this is an example from Somalia. And I was also told of an example where communities are coming to um, back to places from situations of displacement where it is impossible to reintegrate, uh, also due to the fact that their agricultural land could no longer be utilized um, and so the reintegration opportunities for children and their families almost non-existent. And this is non-existent. And this is a quote that I really loved from a colleague who said, resilience is so bottomed out that their best choice is to join an armed group. Next slide. Um, just conscious of time. Um, on, in terms of other violations, uh, there are some uh, verified instances of killing due to clan related conflict over, say, access to water and uh, unexploded ordnance in agricultural lands, for instance. In terms of looking at uh, education, there is some link with out of children school, uh, out of school children due to drought. Uh, and this gender actually relates to this. Um, when families are able to send their kids to school, they choose to send boys specifically. And like I mentioned earlier, the proximity of military personnel uh, to schools in situations of emergency relief makes them uh, a target for armed groups who are intentionally uh, targeting the, the military forces. Next slide. Um, in terms of the challenges that colleagues have specified, there are a range of tools and mechanisms that are used across our communities that are used to assess risk, but they're not shared across each other. Of course, climate lens has not yet been applied to our work of monitoring and reporting. Like I said, climate peace and security debate does not account for children. And I was told that gray violations are also not as well integrated to begin with as other protection concerns. And needless to say, climate shocks exacerbate vulnerability in terms of livelihoods, housing, destruction, and disease outbreaks, poverty, and malnutrition. Uh, they also contribute to increase in intercommunal conflict and violence, for instance, in the face of water scarcity and food insecurity. And finally, uh, as I said, this is complicating our work on distribution on the ground. Uh, just very briefly, next about solutions uh, that I've tried to extrapolate for uh, those of you who are more um, based in the field. Next slide. Um, 
the colleagues have pointed out a couple of interesting things in terms of multi sectoral assessments, where um, with recognition that some of the sectors are really siloed and they do do um, analyses that account for climate as indicators that these could be strengthened in terms of sharing um, and kind of cross pollination. This goes to the conflict, uh, to the coordination point. Stacy, you can the next slide. Um, and also the, there is scope in my understanding from colleagues in the CPAOR to also um, to also, thank you very much. Uh, they're looking at, you know, as, as we're looking at how populations and children are affected to look at, to go to the extent of looking at exposure to other violations. Uh, positively, UNICEF, OCHA and others are already uh, taking climate change issues into account as we're requesting funding, for instance. So that's been noted and um, are conducting child-centered risk analyses that include climate indicators should be encouraged to share them across sectors. So far, I learned that UNICEF does them, but at the, it stays within, um, within the agency. One final point that I found really interesting is that you know, we could look at our MRM data against the peaks of climate shocks um, to see kind of the, the overlay that I was talking about that came through from one of the studies. And finally, um, recommendations that are coming out for the paper, you can move to the, the next slide. They're really around risk assessments and adaptation measures. Um, and like I said, the fact that UNICEF could take part in multi-sectoral assessments or be consulted in development of ad hoc assessment tools, UNICEF is a critical partner for us uh, on the ground for monitoring and reporting. Um, there's also uh, an expression of need for stronger um, climate sensitive programming, which is probably more relevant to your work, where we can identify low cost solutions from child centered perspective uh, with programs targeting children and child led programming to reduce vulnerabilities. And finally, colleagues have asked for technical support by way of mentoring, training, coaching, and capacity building from my office and also UNICEF HQ, which could be beneficial. So for Q&A later, uh, just to finish with the last slide, um, I would be really interested to know, given what um, this kind of overview of the research looks like and the fact that the agendas are not integrating yet uh, CAC and climate security, what would it mean to do the work of strengthening the political agenda at this level in your twenty work on the ground with respect to climate and security. And I'll leave the contact details for you to also follow up should you be interested in sharing your insights towards the, the research and the paper that will be published in a couple of months' time. Thank you so much, and I hope I didn't find time came in back to you. Yes, thank you so much, Dragica. Uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, presentation and uh, research. Uh, yeah, being based in Mozambique currently, I have witnessed this uh, firsthand. And uh, yeah, as you said, both topics are very, very political, uh, climate and uh, CAC. So when they are together, it's even more political. So it's a, it is a very, very interesting question to respond to. So I ask everyone who is in this, uh, who is in this uh, meeting to think about it and then see what they can ask Dragica to, uh, to address in Q&A. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are moving to our next uh, presentation, uh, which is by Sylvie. Uh, a quick introduction to Sylvie. Sylvie is an independent researcher in anthropology. After 20 years of experience in humanitarian child protection intervention, she decided in 2009 to join the academic world to think her job and strengthen collaboration between research and intervention, which makes it already very interesting. Whatever she does, I think is very interesting. But uh, for this session, she is um, working to broadly explore uh, the different worlds of humanitarian intervention, human rights, and protection of children and youth. 
uh, with a critical eye embracing the complexity of circuits between policymaking and practice. She's currently developing a participatory action research project with a group of former child soldiers who wish to make their situation known 15 years after their demobilization. Uh, Sylvie, uh, the expectations are high. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for putting the pressure. <laughs> uh, thank you, Payman. Anyway, uh, just leave, leave me like four or five seconds or maybe 10 just to share my screen um, and, uh, and share the presentation. I have to find it first here. Okay. And uh, so let me know if there is uh, something that you can't see or um so um just before so i will present you a research that i co um investigated with a colleague uh, called trish hiddleston so some of you might know who's in the in the audience now um it's a research that we did in in central african republic last year um and we finalized around november um and published in december um, about the situation of uh, the, the way the programs are responding to boys who have been victim of sexual violence within the armed forces. So um, this um, was um, a research done um, by All Survivors Project. I was working for them in partnership with the USRG CAC, uh, funded by the Kingdom, Kingdom of Norway, sorry, and uh, with the support of the Central African uh, Republic Plan International. Um, sorry, just starting. Um, so, what what were the questions of this research? Mainly two questions we turned around. Um, one, the first one, what what were the challenges, uh, gaps, and um, and and uh, good practices within the program? So, so what are the existing? The idea was taking stock of the existing programs uh, put in place by the child protection actors, both uh, related to GBV and uh, reintegration. And the second question that we had, sorry, it doesn't work. Yes, uh, no, yes. The second question was, um, how can we improve, or how can the child protection actors uh, can improve these, uh, these programs to better respond to boys, uh, survivors of uh, sexual violence within the army groups? So uh, first thing we, we, we noticed when we went on scoping mission for this uh, research uh, is that all the stakeholders we met, including child protection actors, but also government representatives, survivors associations, is that the issue was real, was existing. There was abuse against boys within the armed forces, without the armed forces. Uh, and there, there was very little done because first, there is very little disclosure of the cases. And when there is disclosure, there is not necessarily always um, uh, the training and the capacity to respond um, accurately. So we decided not to, it was not an investigation of cases. Uh, our research was trying to understand how better respond. So it was a participative research with all these stakeholders. A first round of secondary data with stakeholders um, in Bangui, in the capital, um, like uh, child protection actors again, government bodies, civil society, um, survivors association, um, and then um, a round of uh, focus group discussions on the field in two locations um, with first with child protection actors only and then focus group discussion, including other participants from the community, survivors associations, but also partners like medical staff, justice staff, uh, teachers, and others that are working with uh, the communities. So what are the main results of um, this research. First of all, the way the programs are designed are very classical uh, program. Um, there are in the, in the legal and programmatic framework in the country, there are two, two, two national strategies uh, set in place that uh, respond to that. One to combat GBV and another one to reintegrate uh, children who have been in armed forces and groups. 
There is also a rule of law. So uh, you need to, for repression and reintegration, special criminal court and the system of truth and reconciliation. And the referral systems that you might very well know uh, as a child protection actor. So child protection and GBV areas of responsibility, both in their way responding to the topic. So what about the CAFAG reintegration approach in more details? There is a process. The, the, so first process is identifying and verifying the status of the, the children through armed groups and community networks. Second step is a case management procedure. So it's mainly individualized assessment and individualized plan set of services corresponding to assessment that has been done. And then generally a community-based approach through local child protection committee networks that are called RECOPE, uh, which is Réseau de, um, Communautaire de Protection de l'Enfance in, in French. Uh, what are the services given by this system? So there is a set of services delivered to the children according to the plan that has been done through the case management and according to the, their needs. So medical attention if needed, Medical, uh, there is a, I, I would forget, there is a systematic medical attention when they when they come out of the army group, then follow up medical attention if needed, temporary care if needed, if the families are not there, then process of family reunification and mediation, psychosocial support. And the one that all the kids and families are waiting for is support for education and socioeconomic reintegration. Um, parallel to that, there is sensitization and awareness raising first, to the kids through youth club or informal chat within the program, um, and also to out of, of out of that so families and communities like media campaigns and door to door sensitization. Um, in complement to that, the GBV CRSV related approach is a survivor centered approach, um, and the guiding and, and there are guiding principles for uh, interactions with uh, with. Uh, sorry, I just. I'm just bothered by this, but anyway. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I, I can't see the, the, the side of my of my screen, sorry, because I have this uh, setup uh, of uh, seeing people. So what are the challenges of these two programs and, and, and the child protection uh, action? Uh, something that you might all know very well in times of conflict, particularly acute in, uh, in CAR, I have to say, is the short-term nat nature of programming funding constraints. Um, we've seen uh, now programs are from six months to 18 months long, uh, and it's, it's been improving. I mean, like uh, a few years ago, some programs were three months long. So you don't have time to build trust in general for integration with this time and much less with children who have issues to disclose their situation. So no substantive time to build trust, any quality of medical service provision where there is a need for medical service that to be uh, continued. Um, second challenge, which is the low level insecurity throughout the country. So two main effects is the, of the low level insecurity is that the, child protect, the, the, the children and the families can't reach child protection and humanitarian actors and the, and the reverse, humanitarian actors and child protection actors can't go on the field, reach the, the families and, and the children. And there is a poor ability for the government to rule, to govern, to administer justice, and to be supporting all the actions uh, for the children sometimes. So I think now this year, the situation has improved, but um, beginning of last year, there were still places where uh, there was no government presence. Um, and then substantial stigmatization and sensitivities associated with CRSV in general. Uh, I suppose most of you know that. Uh, this is a challenge because it uh, it um, makes uh, children and families not disclosing the cases. And um, last set of challenges that um, is not least is the is the justice option that is not pursued for many reasons that are there. Risk of stigmatization is one. Fear of reprisals and lack, lack of protection are both there when the government is not present, for example, and the armed groups are still in the community. So authors of CRSV are still there and put children at risk. Uh, financial cost of the, of, of the justice length of time and a general lack of trust in the justice system. 
So what are the strengths and weaknesses to, um, to face these challenges? There are some good, good practices, like it was clear every time we talked with the stakeholders, shop protection actors about sexual violence, they're very aware about the guiding principles. Everybody's insisting on confidentiality, trust, uh, sensitivity of the topic. Uh, and the, the real, there is in car um, very good willingness to, of NGOs to coordinate together through the um, child protection AOR, for example, area of responsibility, for example, um, the different documents that um, I've uh, talked about, like the strategies and, and, and the uh, case management system have been put in place in coordination with all the NGOs. So this is this is a good practice and this, this is very helpful to set up something in place for CRSV against boys um, in, um, in army groups. Uh, the serious challenges are already mentioned, some of them, but we can repeat. Uh, so uh, high access, high access to care is uneven. Uh, rarely can services be, uh, be delivered in the length of time required and, uh, and uh, no access to meaningful justice for victims and survivors in general. Now, the question that we had was about boys. So uh, let's see what uh, is like different or some kind of maybe a little bit stronger than what happens for, for, for girls in a way um, about the challenges. Victim blaming. Victim blaming is, is a thing that is very uh, strong for boys. Um, they're supposed to be complicit of the, of the sexual violence that has occurred. Uh, or perceived in alliance with the enemy um, in the army group. The result is they are rejected, stigmatized, and ostracized. Uh, we've been told um, by one um, child protection actor about uh, a kid who had been slaughtered by his father because he had been abused by peacekeepers and his peers were mocking him. So this was a strong thing. This was the strongest that I've heard, but you know, you, you can see how much the victim, the, the stigmatization and the taboo and, and, and the shame is, 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 is strong. And this is linked to gender stereotyping and stigma, you know. Um, men and boys deterred from expressing their feelings. Uh, being victim of sexual violence is perceived as a weakness for boys, for girls too. But for boys, it's kind of something impossible because boys are not supposed to be weak. And stigma extends to beyond the family. Um, beyond the victim and, and, and the whole family. There was somebody said that, you know, this brings shame, not only to the person level, but also on the family level. And it's more than shame, humiliation is like, it doesn't exist many more, as if he is dead. So uh, what are the other challenges? Uh, they are concerned with data collection and coordination. Even if uh, everybody agrees that the, the the problem exists. Uh, it's complicated to have an extent of how, how many, um, and how. Um, so, and, and and one of the reasons about that is uh, it's there's a funny thing that there is coordination between child protection actors. There real there is coordination between GBV actors, uh, but the two ways of uh, collecting data are not corresponding, they are not, um, so it's complicated to have a clear picture of the extent of the issue. Um, a second uh, round of challenges is lack of resources and appropriate services, so lack of long-term provision of support, we've already, already said that. And, um, and, and, and a third one is the activities and services designed mainly for women and girls. So at the point that in some focus groups, um, some people said, Oh, we have the we we think that donors just want us to protect girls and women, but not boys and men. Uh, whereas we are sure that it's never it's never been told. It's not the intention. Uh, it's not in the programs. But there is this perception that this is all about women and girls and not boys and men. Um, uh, everybody acknowledges that the problem is very acute for girls and women. So this is not a competition. Uh, it's just that uh, there's no specific services uh, for like gendered services, like the, the specific for women and the specific for boys. And there is uh, certainly a lack of expertise in general, but most, uh, most of all, lack of expertise in responding to sexual violence against boys. Um, so, you know, you, you see the circle. So the problem is not known, 
because it's uh, because it's a taboo and because it's not known, we don't know how to respond, and it continues like that. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of the system um, about that? Well, as I said at the beginning, uh, there is an, an awareness of service providers that there is a lack of attention given to boys, victims, survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, and a willingness uh, to engage on, on, on this issue. And this comes with our, uh, this reinforces our choice with this um, uh, research um, that we wanted to do the research with the child protection actors because they are the ones that are able to take um, um, to to understand the importance of the results of the research and and set up actions as a consequence of the research. So, uh, but but since the beginning, there is a willingness of, uh, from their part to engage in that. What are the weaknesses? It's just a repetition of what I already said. So there's a lack of documentation uh, against the topic, a lack of attention in general uh, to, to world boys and a lack of gender specific resources. So what are recommendations? Like every, every time the same recommendations, there are two sorts of recommendations. One sort of recommendation are to do the same, but better. And the second one are to also do things that are new or innovate a little bit um, uh, to, to respond better. So strength, uh, strengthen responses to, to CRSV within CAFAGRO integration uh, program, uh, mean secure and long-term funding, capacity building, because there is a need for specific response, improve coordination and uh, adapt a survivor-centered approach to generate knowledge. Because um, one thing that I didn't uh, say in detail, and, 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 and we can talk if this is a question that you want to discuss in the, in the chat, um, is that uh, the, the data that are generated are mostly about services delivered, but, but less about the, the, the victims or survivors. Uh, another recommendation is to improve access to services. Another is threatened provision of family support. Um, we've seen, and because there have been as well an evaluation of the child protection reintegration program just before this research, um, and, and, and there was one of the recommendations was, was to strengthen the provision of family support um, within this, the, the system because it was uh, mainly targeting the, the children. And we think that for uh, this specific topic of uh, sexual violence, it would be important as well for the kids to have, if they wish so, um, to the, and the, if they wish to disclose to their family, to have their support because as we saw, um, the issue is, is, is going to the family as well. Um, build effective response for boys. So that means uh, different things and fill gaps. For that, there is a need to fill gaps in knowledge. Less you know about the situation, less you will be able to respond uh, properly and specifically. Um, so for that, uh, we also, and as researchers, <laughs> because we have this culture of learning and, 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 and using the learning to, to, to act, then we, we suggest to, that the child protection actors should uh, undertake in-depth mapping analysis to be used to improve the, the programs. Uh, provision of training for that and awareness raising, training of staff, awareness and, uh, uh, raising and sensitization first to kids and youth, because if they don't know what happens to them, it's complicated for them to understand. And, and beyond knowing what happened to them is knowing that there are programs, there is a possibility to receive support within um, a, a confidential manner. Um, so all that should be discussed first uh, in youth club and, and, and the chat that they, they have with children. Uh, considerate the specific approach. So there are very different opinions about what should be a specific approach. If boys should receive the support of men only, or if they can have choices and et cetera. So we said, discuss that within the country and enhance visibility. That's it for now, for me, thank you. Uh, and I stopped sharing my, my screen. Yeah, thank you so much, Sylvie. Uh, very to the point, uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm personally also working uh, uh, in the field and most of the things that you mentioned uh, here in your presentation, we have experienced uh, uh, at the, uh, in the field at the operation level. And yeah, uh, Sylvie uh, just shared uh, the link to the research. I recommend everyone 
to go and uh, read the full uh, research. Uh, I'm sure it is interesting uh, to all of us working in, the, uh, in this field. Uh, let's move quickly to the last presentation we have for today before we go to Q&A session. Um, this presentation is going to be in French. So for all the English speakers uh, who don't know French, you can um, turn on the, the, the interpretation option by clicking on the, the little globe uh, at the bottom of your Zoom. The presentation is by Simon Kangeta. Uh, he has more than 20 years of experience in the humanitarian sector uh, and uh, armed conflicts context, um, particularly in DRC, uh, in the area of child protection um, and particularly children affected by armed conflicts. He is the executive director of the local NGO in DRC called Ajedi or Ayedi, uh, I assume Ajedi, uh, and he is a member of the Syrian Committee of the Alliance for Child Protection, uh, CAFAC Task Force, and Localization Advisory Group uh, in the Alliance. Uh, Simone is going to present uh, about uh, the projects they have and the community-based approach, and also putting children at the center of response uh, when it comes to re reintegration to families uh, uh, and also reintegration uh, to the to the community. Uh, Simon, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> I think Simon, we have a problem with your uh, with your sound. If you can speak loudly. Okay, merci beaucoup. You are on mute, Simon. Yeah, you're back now. Oh. Perfect. Je m'excuse vraiment si cet aspect technique, je pense que je vais éteindre mon caméra pour conserver au fait la petite connexion que j'ai. Et je suis au fait ravi d'être ici cet après-midi pour échanger pendant quelques minutes dans ce fantastique cadre virtuel offert par l'Alliance pour la protection des enfants. Je suis quand même reconnaissant et je remercie du fond de mon cœur toute l'équipe de l'Alliance pour l'organisation de ce forum à portée mondiale. Ma présentation, en fait, elle est intitulée « Programme durable de réintégration des enfants et de prévention de leur recrutement » tel au fait est le thème de notre présentation. Est-ce qu'on peut passer à la deuxième diapositive? OK. Permettez-moi au fait de vous parler un tout petit peu de notre petite structure qui a l'honneur au fait de vous présenter cet exposé aujourd'hui. Au fait, nous travaillons dans AGDICA, c'est une petite organisation locale qui est basée à Ouvira, c'est dans la province du Sud Kivu, à l'est de la République démocratique du Congo. Nous travaillons au fait dans le cadre de la protection de l'enfance et comme le travail de la protection des enfants ce n'est pas un travail qui s'est fait à vase clos. Agedica est membre de plusieurs réseaux de la société civile. Donc, c'est un travail que nous faisons en réseautage, tant au niveau local, national et international. Diapositive suivante. Est-ce qu'on peut bouger vers une autre diapositive? OK, merci beaucoup. Il est donc, je voudrais dire ceci à l'attention faite des collègues qui ne connaissent pas très bien la RDC et surtout l'Est de la RDC. Nous travaillons vraiment dans un contexte fragile. Ce contexte est caractérisé par les cycles de violence 
et d'activisme des groupes armés et non étatiques et étatiques attendus par là et les groupes armés. Alors, ce qui n'empêche pas au fait aux acteurs de la protection des enfants à ce qu'ils puissent se positionner dans ces contextes fragiles pour travailler au fait dans plusieurs points au fait de mener des actions de prévention et de réponse aux situations d'abus, de négligence, d'exploitation ou de violence à la contre des enfants. Diapo et suivant. Alors, la motivation profonde de notre travail, ce n'est pas vraiment quelque chose de nouveau, mais par contre, c'est de partager notre expérience de terrain en mettant l'enfant au, au centre de toutes les actions. Ainsi, donc, vous allez remarquer que toutes ces actions programmatiques que nous menons reposent au fait sur, sur des concepts. Il y a la prévention et il y a aussi la réponse. Quand on parle de la prévention, c'est que nous menons des activités de sensibilisation de proximité et de plaidoyer à, tout, à tous les niveaux, au fait, en ciblant et presque toutes les parties prenantes. Alors, quant à la réponse, il est dit que nous sommes là avec la réponse. Dans le cas de la réintégration, c'est pour <coughs> promouvoir la réintégration au niveau individuel, au niveau familial, communautaire et sociétal, puisque la réintégration doit se figurer dans un tout complexe. Alors, la complémentarité entre les deux concepts nous donne, au fait, l'idée d'une programmation durable, puisqu'on ne peut pas parler de la prévention sans pour autant inclure quelque chose de la réponse dans le cadre, au fait, de, de bien et d'assurer le bien-être des enfants que tous nous voulons voir. Merci. Passons à la diapositive suivante. Alors, pourquoi nous avons intitulé cette diapositive « Une programmation soutenue » Il est vrai que c'est une programmation soutenue, c'est plus que nous, au fait, nous sommes des praticiens. Ce qui est vrai est que nous relions la théorie à la pratique. Et cette théorie, où est-ce que nous tirons cette théorie Nous tirons, au fait, toutes ces théories-là, c'est au niveau global. Et dans le cadre, au fait, de l'Alliance pour la protection de l'enfant dans l'action humanitaire, je pense qu'il y a eu toute une section qui a parlé, au fait, du travail et des groupes, de travail, des task forces et des, et des initiatives. Alors, au niveau global, qu'est-ce que nous nous tirons en tant que praticiens? Nous tirons, par exemple, le travail fait par les groupes spécialisés de l'Alliance dans le cadre de la production des ressources, dans le cadre de la production des outils et à même des études de recherche. Je suis très content quand même d'attendre Sylvie qui a parlé au fait d'une recherche. Il y a aussi ce que nous allons développer après. C'est quelque chose qui a soutiré, qui a tiré ce soubassement dans une recherche et d'une étude de Charles Soldiers International. Nous aurons par exemple le temps d'en parler un tout petit peu dans la section suivante. Alors, ces outils qui sont produits, ces ressources qui sont produits au niveau global sont disséminées au niveau, on commence toujours par le niveau international, notamment par les webinars et d'autres techniques. Ça se relaie au niveau, et, au niveau des terrains, en fait, par les acteurs de la protection de l'enfance qui sont sur terrain. Alors, nous, nous sommes des praticiens nous devons nous approprier maintenant ces outils. Comment est-ce que nous nous approprions ces outils-là? C'est par l'élaboration des propositions de projets, des programmes. Alors, ces programmes-là, ces projets-là, nous aident, au fait, à conduire des actions préventives et des réponses. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, donc, 
Il y a un autre soubassement dont j'avais parlé tantôt là, c'est le soubassement et l'étude menée par Charles Soldiers International en 2016. C'est une recherche qui était conduite par une équipe des ONG nationales avec l'appui financier des ONG internationales. Et cette recherche est intitulée « Ce que disent les filles ?» Donc, améliorer le pratique de démobilisation et de réintégration des jeunes filles associées aux forces et aux groupes armés en RDC. Cette étude a porté nécessairement à faire participer aussi les bénéficiaires, les filles enseignement associé aux groupes armés dans le nord Kivu, le sud Kivu et dans l'Itourie. Il y a eu beaucoup de problèmes soulevés lors de cette recherche-là, surtout eh, lorsqu'on parle du soutien à la réintégration. Qu'est-ce que les filles ont soulevé dans cette étude ou dans cette recherche? Les filles ont soulevé qu'il n'y avait pas vraiment beaucoup de moyens mis à leur disposition pour avoir des soutiens à la réintégration. Maintenant, qu'est-ce que Ajédica a fait? pour essayer de trouver certaines, so et certaines solutions aux problèmes soulevés par les filles d'une façon là générale, nous avons parlé au fait de la, de, de la potentialité de l'agriculture. Et au fait, là, nous nous sommes concrètement, c'est déjà vraiment une marche qui nous a conduit dans une embarcation dans les bateaux de l'autonomisation financière avec plusieurs passagers à bord. Là, je parle vraiment d'une métaphore. Alors, l'accès au soutien à la, à la réintégration, c'est une des solutions pour qu'on puisse parler en fait, des de, de programmes de réintégration durable. Et là, nous sommes vraiment, vraiment dans un petit village, puisque avec les moyens qui étaient mis à notre disposition, on ne devrait pas quand même expérimenter eh, cette pratique sur toute l'étendue de la RDC. Nous nous sommes dit, avec le peu de moyens que nous avons, essayons d'abord de mettre en pratique les théories ou les recommandations faites par Charles Soldiers. Nous nous sommes rendus compte qu'avec cette potentialité de l'agriculture dans ces milliers-là, les filles sont arrivées quand même à, faire, à avoir une autonomisation eh, financière. Alors, cette, cette, cette eh, autonomisation financière, elle a connu en fait la participation des filles et d'autres membres de, de la communauté. Passons en fait à la diapositive suivante. Alors, et parmi aussi les recommandations données par Charles Soldiers International, on a expérimenté en fait l'acceptation communautaire. Comment nous sommes arrivés à cette acceptation communautaire c'est par rapport aux défis. Lorsque les filles rentrent dans la communauté, elles ont connu les problèmes de rejet. Alors, elles-mêmes ont proposé certaines activités à pouvoir mener dans la communauté pour qu'elles puissent être considérées, pour qu'elles puissent être aussi vues comme les femmes du premier rang. Alors, ensemble avec les jeunes filles, on a décidé de pouvoir créer une coopérative agricole. Cette coopérative agricole a regroupé plus de 30 filles enseignement associées aux groupes armés et d'autres membres du réseau communautaire pour la protection des enfants. Et là, je pense qu'il y a parlé de recoper. Ça, c'est une approche, en fait, communautaire 
il y a de l'expérience ou utilisé presque un peu partout avec les acteurs de la protection et de l'enfance. On passe à la diapositive suivante. Diapositive suivante. OK. Parlant au fait de, de la prévention. Le travail que nous avons mené sur le terrain, c'est un travail qui nous a aidé au fait à grâce à des actions de réponse et dans les cas d'espèce, l'accès au soutien à la réintégration pendant plus de quatre ans nous a aidé vraiment à réduire quelques facteurs de risque, notamment il y a la pauvreté dans ces milieux-là. Vous voyez, lorsqu'il y a une coopérative, lorsqu'il y a des initiatives comme des AVEC, nous tendons vraiment vers la réduction de la pauvreté. Or, dans l'historique, lorsqu'on avait interrogé les filles, elles ont rejeté, par exemple, tel groupe armé, c'est puisqu'il y avait cette question-là de pauvreté dans leur famille. Il y avait cette question-là de pauvreté dans leur communauté, raison pour laquelle il fallait au fait travailler sur ce facteur de risque-là. Et en travaillant sur ces facteurs de risque, avec du potentiel agricole dans ces milliers, nous nous sommes rendus compte qu'il y avait quand même une certaine efficacité dans la prévention. Bien sûr, la prévention, ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on peut retrouver dans des jours. L'efficacité de la prévention prend toujours du temps. Nous avons travaillé sur quatre ans et nous commençons maintenant à palper la réalité, l'efficacité de cette prévention-là. Alors, la prévention aussi repose sur la durabilité. Par cette durabilité, nous avons constaté qu'il y a l'engagement et l'implication des communautés au niveau du modèle socio-écologique. Alors, dans le cas du modèle socio-écologique, on retrouve toujours qu'il y a les enfants eux-mêmes au premier plan, c'est parce que nous devons associer ou impliquer les enfants. Il y a aussi les familles et les communautés, là on trouve au fait les membres des communautés avec, avec les recopés. Alors, l'ensemble de toute la communauté là, lorsqu'elle est impliquée, on tend, nous tendons vers maintenant à former une grande société. En fait, c'est dans ce sens-là que nous avons parlé de la durabilité de la prévention doit reposer nécessairement sur l'engagement et l'implication des communautés au niveau de ces modèles. Est-ce qu'on peut passer à l'autre diapositive? Il est vrai que le travail que nous, avons, que nous faisons sur le terrain et surtout en matière de réintégration, lorsque les filles reviennent dans la communauté, il y a eu toujours des défis. Parmi les défis, on a noté qu'il y a eu la perte de valeur, surtout chez les jeunes filles. Quand une jeune, une jeune fille rentre dans sa communauté, et qu'on se rend compte que cette fille-là était utilisée par les groupes armés dans la communauté et surtout avec la culture de ces milliers-là, on la considère comme une fille du second rang et n'a pas de considération. Elle perd sa valeur. À un certain niveau, il y a eu rejet de la famille et de la communauté. La famille rejette la fille, mais il faut travailler un peu plus avec les recopés aussi pour créer ce climat-là de confiance et d'acceptation communautaire. En termes de leçons apprises, être accepté par la famille et la communauté, c'est vraiment une initiative locale qui concerne tout le monde. Ah, il y a aussi les actions programmatiques conçues à travers les modèles socio-économiques doivent nécessairement avoir un impact durable à la réintégration des enfants et de leur prévention au recrutement. 
Merci et j'attends vos feedbacks. OK. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, uh, I, was, I was listening to it uh, through the translation. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was really great. Uh, the way uh, that practitioners on the ground uh, dealing with situations like this is always very complex, always very uh, multisectoral. And uh, yeah, the issue, not the issue, but like the, 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 the practice of prevention uh, has a very, very high impact, as we all know, on, on this matter. Um, so now that's time to, to move on to the Q&A session. Uh, we are going to have uh, Dragica, uh, Simon and Sylvie here, all of them, to respond to questions uh, and um, answer comments. Um, I as we saw, uh, as we heard, uh, we have one presentation, the Rogitsos presentation, talking about the political uh, policy level at the global scale and how the climate uh, disasters and insecurity would impact uh, children uh, in armed conflict and how uh, it would um, uh, impact their vulnerabilities. And then Sylvie is talking about uh, sexual violence against boys and how uh, our service uh, provision as NGOs or stakeholders uh, can be um, uh, influential, impactful to, to uh, address the issue. And then we have Simone's uh, presentation talking about uh, community level prevention um, and how we can uh, on the ground basically respond to prevent uh, prevention of uh, uh, vulnerabilities, basically, for, for children in armed um, conflict. So yeah, the open, uh, the, the floor is open uh, for everyone. Um, if you want to um, ask questions, I don't know if uh, uh, I'm asking the uh, producers if we are able to have the speakers on. Uh, or not, but if not, we can have the questions on, on the chat and we can ask uh, one by one. And there are already a few questions. Um, one was uh, up there, uh, I think uh, I saw that by uh, Marcello about indicators. I don't know if uh, Dragica, if you caught that question or not, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I did catch it, thank you, Feynman. Yeah, if you can go ahead with responding to that and then we go to other questions. Absolutely, and if you don't mind, a uh, question just came through on any guidelines, resources for designing programs and interventions for with conflict affected children during climate change. So thank you, Marcella, as well for intervening in the chat earlier. I think for me, the focus of this research was really to, which was an ambitious goal, draw the link between rights-based violations and climate change. It's near impossible to do it, but I wanted to go through the exercise of looking at each violation and examining where are the linkages, because as I said, no one had, had drawn them. In the course of research, I did ask every uh, respondent to tell me what specific tools they use. So what I will do is um, in addition to the references to child-centered analyses, which actually I just Googled uh, during our session <laughs> to see which ones are public from UNICEF. I have not actually seen them. Um, they've been uh, told to me by colleagues in Mozambique, for instance. I was really keen to see some regional examples that were pointed out in Africa as well. What I see online is for Asia Pacific, but again, those are not conflicts that conflict affected um, countries that I'm, that I'm finding. So what I will do is um, have a compendium of all of the tools in annexes to the paper to, to show what are the different types of risk assessments and analyses that colleagues are uh, doing. One of the really interesting, well, I can't tell you what specific climate indicators look like in these, and I can try to source these both for my own information and, and for yours as well. Um, it is interesting that 
in my interviews with um, different sectors and those who are who are referencing uh, child-centered tools, everyone who talked about looking at um, kind of uh, WFP data around food insecurity and you know trying to assess numbers of children who might be impacted by drought, for instance, or uh, in references to, to flooding and looking at some of the IOM data um, that was coming through. So that's what comes to the top of my mind. But again, the challenge is really trying to make this distinct link between um, climate change and, and rights-based violations. And uh, let's see what we can achieve with this, at least this first, with this first step. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ragitza. Uh, I got three questions in private chat for me. Uh, they're all similar, but uh, more related to you, Sylvie and Simon about, so you talk about uh, uh, the funding and uh, the programs that are sometimes short. And also Simon was talking about the community engagement. Um, so in this situation that we need community engagement at the same time, long-term uh, commitment to the community that sometimes uh, local or uh, smaller NGOs, they cannot make that commitment because uh, the money is not coming. Uh, so uh, the question is basic. I'm trying to summarize three questions in one. The question is like, how can uh, NGOs or donors approach this? I mean, donors probably is clear, <laughs> increasing the funds and like making the uh, the programs uh, longer. But like, how can uh, local and international NGOs uh, uh, basically address this issue? Uh, maybe Simon uh, or Sylvie. I don't know which one you want to go first. Maybe maybe Simon would be better about the community. I mean, is is really close to this experience of the community. I, I have my opinion, but but um, Simon is really experienced in that, and I suppose he can reply better. Simon, if you can go ahead. Oui, merci beaucoup euh, pour la question. Moi, je pense que de notre côté, nous sommes des praticiens et je vais répondre à cette question en tant que praticien et ce que nous avons vécu et de l'exemple un peu palpable de ce que nous faisons. Au fait, si je prends l'exemple de Charles Soldias dans le cadre de sa recherche, il y a eu autant de recommandations. Alors, nous avons, disons, et utilisé certaines recommandations pour essayer de résoudre certains problèmes qui ont été soulevés au fait euh, par les filles lors de cette recherche-là. Et nous nous sommes rendus compte que, que pour avoir beaucoup d'impact sur le terrain et avec peu de moyens mis à notre disposition, ce qui est vrai est que la réintégration, c'est quelque chose et qui doit prendre du temps et qui doit, qui doit être vraiment à long terme. Nous nous sommes dit, qu'est-ce que nous devons faire? Puisque effectivement, nous sommes des ONG, une ONG locale. On n'a pas assez de moyens pour répondre nécessairement aux besoins des filles par rapport à la problématique de la réintégration. Alors, il fallait, au fait, travailler avec les bénéficiaires, avec les, les, les besoins, évaluer les besoins des filles dans leur propre communauté. Aller maintenant vers la communauté, associer la communauté à travers les structures communautaires qu'on appelle les recopées, les réseaux communautaires pour la protection des enfants. Ensemble, Nous nous sommes dit, qu'est-ce que nous devons faire? On avait proposé juste un petit projet d'appui en intrants agricole pour faire participer les filles, pour faire participer la communauté dans la production, dans la transformation et dans la commercialisation de ces produits-là. Tu vois? Donc, on a aussi 
chercher une solution ensemble avec les bénéficiaires. Alors, les bailleurs ou les partenaires, c'est aussi une ONG, une petite ONG internationale, ASODH, basée en France, qui a accepté au fait de continuer les activités de Chad Soldiers après leur départ. Tu vois, donc il y a eu l'impact. Chad Soldiers a commencé avec le peu de moyens, capitalisé au fait dans la communauté, avec l'accompagnement d'une ONG locale qui connaît très bien la population, qui a des assises communautaires. C'est à ce niveau-là qu'on a parlé de l'engagement communautaire. Voilà, ça c'est un exemple un peu pratique qui nous a poussé au fait à impliquer la communauté pour trouver une solution au problème des bénéficiaires dans le cadre au fait aussi de prévenir les risques et d'apporter une réponse à cette problématique-là de réintégration. Merci. Yes, if I can add, uh, Paiman, just uh, from the point of view of international NGOs, or um, I've, because I've been in charge of the evaluation of the program as well in 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 CORE and of the reintegration program um, just before this research, um, the experience with the the Recope, the community networks, is not always very good um, because when the The NGO is not providing anymore, then they, they're not present anymore, or most of them are not present anymore. So this is, and 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 one of the solutions that um, has been suggested by uh, by different actors is uh, because what you see when an NGO is arriving, everybody knows how it works. So there is a creation of a new community network and another NGO and a new and another new community network. And if you ask the recope. Um, uh, would they work for? They don't. They don't have the sense to work for the community, but they work for the NGO. So if the NGO stops, they stop. You know. Um, so one of the suggestions was really to work with um, the existing um, associations of groups that are uh, previous to the arrival of the of the NGO, and for example, in terms of sexual violence, working with survivors association. Now, survivors' associations are now always very public because of the confidentiality issue. So this is a matter of connecting uh, with discretion with uh, maybe the organizations uh, in the capital or, um, you know, and, and, and connect discreetly with, with the people we can, we can help and we can suggest who are or what are the organizations that could help. Um, because it's very complicated in, in a precarious um, uh, environment, which is always the environment of a conflict, is that uh, you, you have as an external organization, as maybe as a local NGO, it's, it's easier, but as an external organization, it's very complicated to, uh, to know what is serious and what is not serious among the people who will, who will arrive. And, and, and that's a real issue because, Um, you if, even if you have good fundings, actually, you need you, you need people in the field that uh, first they know well the situation, and also they're able to continue where there is an interruption, where there is insecurity or whatever reason uh, when the NGO is is not there anymore. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's yeah that's the struggle that we usually have uh, in the, the humanitarian sector. Uh, lack of money, lack of time, uh, lack of access sometimes, a uh, very difficult situation and context to, to operate. And when it comes to uh, children in armed conflict, it is even more difficult. And for example, like uh, you mentioned at the society and community level, the issue of, uh, for example, mocking uh, boys sexually abused, uh, I can even apply that for the climate insecurities as well. Sometimes when we go for Uh, climate action projects, uh, we get mocked by the community. You're like, hey, we have so many problems and you're here for this, like something that like nobody talks about. And it comes from the government level as well. Uh, it is very difficult sometimes for us to, uh, to work with the government. And uh, we have all experienced that. So yeah, the policy level, uh, donor level, uh, practitioners, community, they all should work together to, to be able to, um, to solve this problem. And we have 
two, three minutes uh, before closing the, the session. I just wanted to ask uh, each one of the speakers to, if they have any last comments, any last sentence uh, or recommendations, uh, uh, please, please go ahead. Um, starting from Duragitsa, maybe, because she was the first presenter. Thank you so much. And thanks again for including me. I'm really excited and intimidated by this audience. Like I said, we are so elevated from, from the work that you're doing on the ground. But I wanted you to leave at least being aware of the global conversation around climate, peace, and security. And the fact that in the course of doing this research, I myself uh, discovered structures around climate, peace, and security that exist within the UN that I had not heard about previously. For instance, we have a climate security mechanism um, that came about in 2018. That's led by UNDP, UNEP, and uh, DPPA. That is a production kind of research and analysis production arm, but they're only now starting to work on and think about gender, let alone children. Um, what I've also discovered are some of the structures that are coming as a result of the resolutions that I was talking about in the field. So now we're embedding posts like climate security advisors. Um, but when I investigated whether our uh, child protection advisors are aware of those posts and missions where they're embedded, the answer was no. Um, so I'm hoping that there are some concrete ways that we can suggest how linkages could be made to make sure that the children the conflict agenda is connecting the dots with the infrastructure around climate, peace, and security. And you can help us do that at the field uh, and make us aware of some of the other ways to, to coordinate from, from your side and do feel free to stay in touch. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, Sylvie and Simone, quick, sorry. Yes. Uh, just saying that um, I've explained like the circle that we don't have information, so we, so we don't act because we don't know how to act, etc. I think that's uh, first thing uh, to know is that even if you don't know exactly what it it, it means, what it occurs, and and all the details, you don't need all the documentation documentation finished before supporting children and responding to their issue. So respond to sexual violence against boys and girls when they, when they happen, even if you don't have the whole study and, and, and documentation, and more you will be able to respond to this kind of uh, topic, more you will learn from their experience, from what you do with them, and more you, you would improve. So no, there, there, there is a need for documentation, but this is not something that you have to wait for uh, to be able to start uh, responding to the to the topic, I think if there is something to um, to have that to have in mind, it would be that for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, we have to close the session uh, now. Uh, there will be a, a poll uh, for the for this session. Please click on it. It is shared in the chat. Uh, it will be shared very soon. And yeah, thank you so much. Uh, have a nice day and you are set to go for the next session. Uh, have a nice evening and day. Ciao.